Okay, thank you very much everybody for coming and thank you very much to Hannah and Rachel for letting me come and waffle again in your in your session. Um, since TAG in Syracuse, this paper has now been published in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. It's available online. So if I speak too fast or this makes no sense, please do go and read the paper instead. Um, and I'll sit down now. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so my central argument today is that we have under-theorised how we think about difference as a way of operating and making sense of the archaeological record and some of our theories. Um, and um, I, I think that we've, we've done quite a good job of taking on the kind of post-Cartesian, non-Cartesian ideas but for some reason, they're still very prevalent and they keep coming back to bite us in the bottom, if you like. And I think um, one of the reasons that I wanted to explore um, post-humanism was that I saw it as one of the ways in which perhaps we could begin to think about difference in other ways. We could begin to take different narratives to think about people, bodies, material cultures in, in other ways. And so I'm going to draw on two um, an anthropologist and a post-human philosopher who have inspired me, Rosie Gray Dotti and then Henrietta Moore, um, and also a little bit on Deleuze and Guattari. And I think all of those authors are, are working to a way in which we can celebrate difference and diversity in social cultures. And um, as many of you will know, my, my research area is the LBK, so I'm going to draw on an early Neolithic linear band ceramic case study in the second half of the paper. Um, but to start with, I thought I'd kind of try and lay out my perspective on this complex theory. Um, so how do we theorise difference? How do we think about what difference is? We're now familiar, particularly here at this conference, with the idea of challenging Cartesian dualities. So this idea that you have an opposing um, uh, opposite that goes alongside with the thing that you're, you're defining. So um, biology on the one hand, and culture on the other. So these are ideas that we've, we've tried to dismiss, um, but they've also become very deeply embedded within what we're thinking. Um, and part of the reason for that, I'd argue, is that we haven't really thought about how difference is made in these accounts. We tried to criticise the opposing binaries, but not looked at actually the underlying methods of how these differences are being created. Um, and, and to do that, we need to think a little bit about how these, these differences arise. And for this, I draw on um, Henrietta Moore's discussion uh, of difference in terms of, of gender, where she argues that um, the, the two concepts of male and female are co-created at the same time. And because of that, because they rely on each other for definition, they must have very little overlap. The kind of characteristics that one has must exclude the other. And as a result, um, you can't incorporate overlapping experiences within those different um, those different characteristics or those different categories. And so to think about difference in new ways to try and challenge this, um, I've been inspired by Deleuze and Guattari, particularly their attempt to unpack these Cartesian dualities in anti-Oedipus. So they, they argue that these approaches um, to difference arise in what they call psychoanalytic or Freudian thought, um, and they call it defined by lack. So this is an aim to char characterise the world, to categorise it in terms of negation, of saying what things aren't, of separating out and bounding certain characteristics by, by that kind of duality between having things and not having things. And um, within that, the power structures are deeply embedded. So the kind of uh, hierarchies that we see between men and women arise out of these kinds of characteristics and this way of categorising things and saying things aren't capable of changing, they're solid. Um, so Henrietta Moore argues that this sort of sense of defined by lack is powerful because it gives us a means of shaping social discourse, so bringing about these senses of power. Um, so rather than it just being a description of the world, it's actually an active way of making categories in the world. And a good example of this, and I picked this because I think it's quite visually striking, is when we think about the ways in which race remains prevalent despite it being dismissed as a biological concept. So the ways in which different 
discourses around race are shaped by the language that we use and the ways in which we make definitions make it persist despite the fact that we biologically know that races don't exist so when you go to get your race uh, your dna kit tested you get your kit you test your dna and you know what's coming up that seeks to reinforce the kind of discourse we have around difference in which categories are exclusive and, ex and, and expel other things, rather than the case that we know and that there's huge variations within that are bigger um, than those between. So Deleuze and Guattari try to offer an alternative to thinking about this sort of difference um, uh, ways of thinking about difference and they propose difference a different definition of difference so this is divine defined within itself so this arises in their rhizomic thought in which rather than categories being one solid thing things begin to expel out of and tumble out of and mix in with different ideas so this is for them is an explicit political project to find ways of challenging the power structures that they saw themselves uh, as, as coming out of um, they wanted to dismantle particular hierarchies. They weren't, weren't trying to explain the world as it was. They wanted to create new pathways of thought that allow us to challenge the way that things are. Um, so their argument is not that thinking about difference to find within itself um, will give us an endless variation that will break down um, the power structures that we see around us, but rather that it allows us to take different viewpoints on those power structures that allow us to open up different types of thought. Um, and so this has been taken on uh, by uh, Rosie Brezotti's, the, the uh, feminist post-humanist that, that I've um, found uh, most useful in terms of thinking about my work. And she comes at it then from an explicitly feminist perspective to try and reject some of the ways in which hierarchies between um, men and women and the patriarchy is sort of solidified within uh, Western thought. Um, and she's, she talks about how the project to expand humanism, to, to go beyond the kind of able, white, male, Western body, has failed. Um, and, and how if we, we want to try and take uh, certain, some of the power structures sweep and break them down, that hasn't, hasn't worked, it's just sort of sought to re reinforce them. And so what she argues is that in order to challenge those things, um, we don't need to challenge the way difference is formed, but begin to think about multiple ways taking up different viewpoints and for her she suggests this process of nomadism where you move through different viewpoints and take them up and you don't settle down you embody different experiences and and, and try and present multiple ways of being in the world multiple ontologies rather than particular single ones um, i think uh, so while um i I think that um, necessarily she's not writing uh, this is how you should interpret the past. I think there are things that we can take away from this particular point of view um, from, uh, from trying to do a, a difference to find within theory and archaeology. Um, and I sort of see that firstly as trying to look much more at the variability that we have within the categories that we, we see around us. So not trying to sort of define the absolute or the average, but thinking about the variation that we have and also to try and take on this sense of nomadism where we try and look at multiple perspectives and put them um, into contrast and comparison with each other. How am I doing for time? You have, you're about halfway through. Brilliant. Right. Um, so that massively shortened down discussion of the theory, um, but uh, I'd like, what I'd like to do now is try and show how I've applied these ideas to a particular context. And that's the, the linear bank ceramic. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, it's the earliest Neolithic through much of Central Europe. It starts first about 5,500 BC and ends about 5,000 BC. And it's sort of classically seen as that early Neolithic culture with houses and pottery and polished stone tools and farming and, and houses as well. So, for the, for the linear band ceramic for the LBK, um, like... Uh, John Robb and Oliver Harris noted in their paper um, in American Antiquity from last year, um, gender has actually been a minimal concern for archaeologists studying the Neolithic. Um, it's not been something which has been explicitly debated in great depth, there have not been huge arguments. 
instead what you see is rather a sort of binary gender that's been taken for granted. So it's not that we've not said men and women, it's that what those categories mean has sort of been um, assumed. Uh, and what I'd like to do now is to look first at how that idea has arisen out of um, sort of the, the burial evidence and then go to look at how taking an approach to variability um, can sort of rewrite some of those um, ideas. So hugely I think we've interpreted men and women and the relative status between them massively through the defined by lack um, approach. So women are often seen as having lower status in their burials than men and part of the reason for that um, when you read why people have explicitly stated that in the literature, what they say is it's because they're less frequent. Women are less frequently buried at cemeteries. Um, and therefore, on the basis of pure numbers, um, women are sort of seen as, as, as less, having less status. But when I went away and looked at burials, we had a database of about 3,000 burials from across the UK. Sorry, this doesn't show up. You can see that women do, do are less frequent at cemeteries uh, than at, uh, women here are less frequent than males at cemeteries, but there are equal numbers on settlements. Um, so the assumption uh, that uh, women are uh, less frequent at cemeteries is not statistically significant, but there is a slight dip. But the argument has always been because women are more frequent at settlements, they're, they're lower status. So. Um, we actually see equal numbers of men and women. It's just on this slight dip here, which isn't statistically significant, that this argument has been made. And it's an absolute argument. It's not one of degrees, it's complete. You see a difference, therefore it's a complete difference. The second reason um, has also been in the way in which um, artifacts and grave goods have been interpreted, particularly these polished stone adzes that we see in male graves. So, they occur in about 34% of male graves and in 5% of female graves. But again, they've been focused on as a really key element of masculinity and of status for males in the graves. So despite only really occurring in a third of male graves, it then gets translated onto the whole of the assemblage that we see as masculinity for the LBK. Um, and and like this, this chap here, the, the hunter warrior from Schwanfeld, um, who uh, had a very bad knee, died in his 20s, but is still presented and given a name and a character as if he is this vibrant, active, powerful man. Sometimes people mention that there's kind of an equivalent grave good for women of grinding stones, but when I went and looked at the data, it was actually in 5% of all graves, so men and women. It's not sort of a female grave good, it's actually equally distributed across the different sexes. Okay. Um, so um, I went away to try and look at whether we see any relationships between the different grave goods and whether we are seeing particular packages. And, and when I went uh, and looked at that, what I found was that actually the polished stone was probably having more impact on the type of grave good assemblages that people had than the sex of the individual. So in the first slide, we see patterning and everything groups up around the polished stone when you take it away, all of the patterning completely dis dis dissolves. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead as I've only got uh, a couple of minutes left. So instead of seeing these rather static images of male and female graves, actually we have a lot of complexity and overlapping practices. And running alongside that, we also see a great deal of creativity. So all sorts of different things going on, suggesting that there's quite a drawn out um, process of burial, such as bones being moved, but also rather than polished stone going into the grave in very, very particular described ways, there can actually be really creative moments with it. So here this chap's head has been laid on the polished stone, and here two axes have been deliberately broken and then placed at the knees of the individuals as if they're sort of shooting out from the knees. And I think some of the bigger, na bigger narratives miss these moments of creativity in which individual statements are made around the particular grave goods. Um, and so um, now I'd like to go on and think a little bit more about the variability that we see in gendered life ways. Um, and uh, drawing on two particular pieces of work. Firstly, looking at the 
muscle attachments in the lower limb. McIntosh found that for women, the variation that you find in the, the strength and the, the form of the lower limb bones is greater than the variation that you see in the modern world between sedentary people and athletes. So a huge amount of diversity of experience over the life weight for women that's becoming sort of written into the body, into the fabric of the bones itself. And then in terms of the strontium isotopes, we see hugely great variability for women and a much narrower range, <laughs> narrower range for men. Right, in which case I shall, I knew cutting down a 20 minute paper to 15 minutes was going to be challenging. Challenging. Okay. I only want to um, so that. <laughs> just to go on to sort of draw on the conclusions, um, I think what we see um, in the LBK is a much stricter policing for some male bodies and a huge amount of variability and vari variation in possible life ways for women that doesn't necessarily fit in neatly into the binary, binary hierarchy that has been proposed. But rather than those kind of leaky fluid bodies that um, other people have proposed, I'd argue that there's much more, much more ambiguous spaces where people are making much more intimate and creative responses to particular individuals. Um, and I guess I'd like to make a call for people to think about how they're using difference and different categories in the archaeologies um, and then to begin to think about how we can explore difference positively rather than as creating um, hierarchies between different things. Thank you. Thank you.